Welcome to the broadcast tonight, a look at perhaps the greatest painter of the 20th century, Pablo Picasso. We'll take that look through an exhibition of Picasso's portraits at the Museum of Modern Art here in New York. They're an exhibition there until September 17, 1996. This exhibition, the final exhibition by William Rubin, he is Director Emeritus of Painting and Sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art. His previous exhibitions, including a Picasso retrospective and Picasso and Brock on Cubism. Picasso developed a relationship with you and with this museum. Yeah. How did that happen? The way it came about was, frankly, that we have some pretty great paintings by Picasso of almost every period, but we didn't have a cubist construction. Picasso made very few... They're cubist sculptures. Yeah, they're, cu they're cubist sculptures, but instead of being carved or modeled like clay, they're put together, they're constructed out of tin or metal or paper or wood or whatever. We wanted to have one of those, and we particularly wanted to have the guitar, the metal guitar, which was the first one. And Picasso, who loved these objects, simply didn't want to part with them. Only one ever got out of his studio, and that was a gift to his best friend, uh, Paul Eloi, a French poet in the 30s. Now, so, here's the great story that I've heard, and you tell yeah. me it's true, that you, or someone, yeah. went to Picasso and said, we would like to have the guitar. Good thing. And in consideration of that, sir, we'll give you a Cezanne. Yeah, that was, the, that was the gambit. I had a transparency of the Cezanne, and I wrote in this letter, which made essentially two points. One, that as a museum that had the Demoiselle and the three musicians and so many great works by him, it was a crime that we had no construction sculpture. And second, that the leading American sculptors had been very influenced by these, David Smith, for example, but only from photographs. They had never seen the actual objects. And uh, I made those two points, and I got this message back from him, come bearing Cezanne on, at 5 o'clock on Saturday, I think it was the 4th of March, maybe it was the 3rd of March, anyway, it was a Saturday. We arrive at 5 o'clock, and Picasso brings us in, and he's very curious to see the picture, and so he says, let's open it up, and we take the cover off, and he says, okay, now we put it over here, and while we talk, I, he, he just looked at it, you see. Well, we talked and went around the place from 5 in the afternoon, it was pushing midnight, and we had gone and looked at the sculptures. At one point, he had said, now, what do you fellows want? in exchange for your Cezanne. And I said, well, our number one is the guitar, and our number two is this, and our number three is that. And finally, about a uh, quarter of 12 at night, just listen. I'm having trouble making up my mind. I need a little time to think about this. It was a Saturday. He said, Sunday's a family day. Come back Monday <laughs> at 5 o'clock, same time, and I'll give you my answer. I arrive at the door, ring the bell, Picasso himself comes to the door, which I discovered later was something that rarely, if ever, happened. And he had an expression of someone who had just lost both their parents. He looked so sad. And he put his arm around me and he said, Ah, Rubin, I have bad news for you. God, I cannot take your Cezanne. And I deflated, you know, <laughs> down about there. <laughs> Then after it sort of sank in, uh, he loved to play cat and mouse, Picasso. He got the juice out of it. Then he said, but I will give you the guitar. And <laughs> but he didn't tell me that until the, the sort of, well, I can't take your, your Cezanne. Yeah. He, he wanted the fun of seeing me deflate and then reinflate. And how did you feel when he told you that? Uh, well, naturally, joy in Mudville. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Ruben on the genius of Picasso. Of all the skills that he had, how do you rank Picasso's ability as a draftsman? Well, I think one could argue that as a draftsman, Picasso could be the greatest draftsman since Leonardo da Vinci. Draftsmanship is what Picasso is about. Everything he does comes out of drawing. His paintings come out of drawing, his sculptures come out of drawing, his prints, everything. Drawing is where it all comes from. And 
Picasso was a master draftsman at the age of 15 or 16. He had, as he said, in essence, to unlearn some of that in order to make pictures that had the childlike appearance of the later pictures, you know? But he had he to unlearn the sort of, what? The, the conventions. I mean, after all, what is draftsmanship but learning conventions? But you have to have the talent then to be able to put them all together instantly. When we say a great draftsman and the best, perhaps, since Leonardo, yeah. what is it that skill? I mean, what is, the, what is it that a great draftsman has? Well, a great draftsman, first of all, is a man who makes the picture essentially out of light and dark, whether he uses color or whether he doesn't. So that's the structure. And the fact that cubism, for example, has no color in it and is probably the greatest style Picasso ever worked in is a perfect example. We don't really miss the color because Picasso's greatness was in light and dark and not in color. So the draftsman is, first of all, a man for whom color isn't central, but light and dark is central, but also for whom the, the, the kind of script of the hand, the, the thousands of ways in which you can use the pen or the, or the uh, plume or whatever you're working with uh, to be expressive, that that is something which Picasso could do in an enormous variety of ways. There are drawings that look almost like Grunewald. Then there are drawings that, that look like they were made by Stone Age men. And uh, Picasso is simply a great, great draftsman. He could also sit down and draw you like this, you know, and really make a quite realistic yeah, picture in no time. But he would never give it to you, would he? He would always oh, no. put it in no. <laughs> Well, he gave it to a few people. But basically, Picasso was not someone who just gave out, gave out pictures. And he didn't do that very often. He just did it once in a while as a kind of virtuoso joke to make those kinds of pictures. But Picasso had a remarkable relationship between the eye and the hand, which is also the mark of Leonardo. Leonardo was able to see the movements of birds' wings, which weren't confirmed until stroboscopic photography. Yeah. You see, it, you, you have to, there's something about the eye and the hand and the relationship of the two as uh, they and, are uh, triggered and, by the mind. Coordination. Yeah, and, and, but also, the way the mind directs them. Picasso, Picasso was able to draw in so many different ways with such incredible invention. If you just look at the drawings in this show, the range of different kinds of drawings in this show, you see more invention than probably you would find in half of the whole rest of 20th century drawing put together. What's amazing about that when you describe it, it is also the great talent of great hitters in baseball. It is oh, eye hand coordination. Absolutely. They, it, it, it's physiological in the first instance. After that, it's something else, you know? It, that's uh, where the art really comes yeah, in to merge with yeah, the art. The, the art merges with the physiology as you're getting to make a statement about experience. The baseball player has the physiology, but he isn't making a statement about experience. Let's say Ted Williams certainly had a better eye than other people. Better than 2020. You, you know, better than, well, he was able to see the ball coming faster, turning, just the way Leonardo was able to see these wings flapping, you see, and, and, on, and the stroboscopic photographs show you that Leonardo is absolutely right. No one else can see those movements with the naked eye. Now, I'm not saying that Picasso necessarily had a stroboscopic eye, but I am saying that Picasso had a remarkable eye for the nuances of movement, light, dark, shape, and so forth, and that he could draw with remarkable rapidity. And he was always drawing. And worked fast. And he worked very, very fast, but not the way Jackson Pollock worked. That is, Jackson Pollock really worked with velocity. Picasso worked fast like this. You know, this would be the speed at which Picasso worked. But Jackson Pollock worked at even greater uh, velocity. But you see, Picasso was making another kind of picture from, from Pollock, and you couldn't have worked with that velocity uh, if you're the making Picasso's, kind of yeah, right. You'll see Picasso and his relationship with the women in his life as reflected through his portraits.
is there a connection between this last of Olga and yeah. this painting, the first painting we see well, here? I think what you have to say is that they show two completely diametrically opposed concepts of woman, so to say. Now, this woman is hard, angular, bony, and devouring. And that woman is like a toy, a plaything. The Soft balloon, and balloon. The balloon that she's playing with is like her. She's, she's the pneumatic woman. She's as if she were a Macy's parade, parade balloon herself, you know? And she's wearing this gay uh, uh, bathing suit. So what you could say is, if the face looks a little monstrous uh, to us, that's because the surreal language is unfamiliar to us. But I think this picture was clearly intended as a light, gay uh, image of uh, a woman with whom Picasso was now very much in love and who for him represented the, uh, the softest, squeeze most squeezable, most delicious kind of, of thing. Is it possible, you must have been asked this a thousand times, to pick out one woman in Picasso's life yeah. and say, she, she he loved more than anyone. I don't know that you could say that he loved more because he loved them all differently. But certainly in the sense of erotic love, uh, that component of love, there's no question that Marie Therese was his greatest love. Uh, the others were uh, more distant, cooler, and so forth. This is the most heated uh, affair, and it lasts a good long time. And he has a child with Marie Therese. Uh, uh, procreation and creation are somewhere down deep in the psyche and in the organism linked together. Then they separate. And for Picasso, they never really separate as much as for other people. They, uh, the notion of artistic creativity is very much bound up with the notion of passion, sexual passion, as if the energies came from somewhat the same source. So here we have big still life that uh, Picasso painted his greatest still life. And his greatest? Uh, I think it's still his greatest life. still life. It's a picture that's so free, so loose, so swinging. Uh, and what's wonderful about it is that it's a picture in which inanimate objects have been made to palpitate with life. And this still life is more life than still. It's unique in that sense. No one has ever, to my knowledge, attempted to turn a still life into a human being. And Picasso did this uh, very consciously. The breasts are represented by the apples. Now, in the first instance, they're simply apples on a red tablecloth, which is on a slatted table. And that's the given of the picture. But you've never seen a table so alive You've never seen breasts that look quite like that. And if you look at the picture next to it... Which is called Sleeping Nude. Which is Marie Therese sleeping. Uh, that picture has breasts of Marie Therese in it, and it also has an apple and a pear down in the lower right. Now, if you look at the fruit there and at the breasts there, and then you look over to this picture, you would have to say that the, that the fruit here is much more reminiscent of the breasts there than it is of the fruit there. Remember that every Picasso picture is seen in the context of his other pictures. So he wants you, as, he look, as you look at this picture, he wants you to remember somewhere in your, your mind that those forms have been used for breasts of yeah. Marie Therese. Yeah. Now, the, the uh, uh, golden pitcher there represents the kind of chest and the neck uh, uh, and perhaps the long uh, handle could be associated with uh, her, one of her golden hairs. It's not literal. The whole point of this is never to be literal. The, the, the table is a table, the apple is an apple, the pitcher is a pitcher, but... But it suggests. Yes, it's a poem about the body of Marie Therese and about the, the palpitating liveness of this creature in the form of a still life which has been galvanized into motion so that it's no longer still. I mean, if you compare the two, this is a lot stiller than, than, than the so-called still life. He also, tell me if I'm right, was a student of other artists and borrowed from them. Absolutely. Yes? I think more than any other artist we know uh, showed his borrowings and 
was happy to show them, yes. But I don't think that this owes anything particularly to other artists. I think this is one of the most original ideas in Picasso's art and relates to the Surrealist movement indirectly insofar as that movement was a movement of poets. And Picasso is now showing us metaphorically what he can do with imagery as opposed to words. As we leave this room and, and walk this way, what will we see in the well, next room? Well, we're going to see in the next room the beginning of the confrontation of Marie Therese and the next person who is important in his life, Dora Maar. We're talking about Dora Mara, the relationship with Picasso. We're not going to stay in this room, but this room does say something about well, the relationship between... Yeah, it tells us that there was a time when Dora was seen as an elegant, exquisite, decorative, charming woman because her image changes later, not so much because she changes, but because the world and Picasso and life changes. Our he, time is right before the World War II. Yeah, I would say this, that he meets her at the beginning of the time of the Spanish Civil War, yeah. and things are getting worse and worse. Already as we go into this room, we see the, the Weeping Woman, which is uh, the world of Guernica, and Dora becomes the carrier of a, uh, of a concern uh, with war, suffering, pain, uh, the sense of enclosure uh, in a, a world that is becoming smaller and smaller for Picasso. We're turning around now in front of two paintings that are amazing to me because they were done on the same day. Van Gogh already painted one of his great masterpieces, the L'Arlesienne, in an hour and a half. Uh, it's very easy for Picasso to paint two pictures in one day. He's painting from memory and he poses himself a kind of question that is ultimately, how do I feel or how differently do I feel about these two women? Because he's in love with both of them in very different ways at this time. And as you look at the two pictures, you can see two quite different concepts of beauty. The, the one of Marie Therese is more the familiar thing that we've seen with lyrical rounded lines, more decorative color, and you can say that given certain distortions, this is a beautiful woman, you know? Yeah. You would not say that about Dora based on this uh, picture. This is a person whose whole interior and psyche is discomforted. But now that discomfort will be associated more and more with Dora, and the discomfort will be not just Dora's, but Picasso's discomfort as the world becomes more complicated as we approach World War II. But if you look at this and just compare the shapes and colors uh, with the other picture, you have two different conceptions of women. Mm -hmm. And he paints these pictures in a way to find out just how he feels. Yeah. He once said to me, uh, my hand tells me what I'm thinking, you know, yeah. that uh, in some way uh, it's not to compare which is more beautiful or anything else, it's just how do I feel about these two women? And he evokes them. Uh, I think uh, Dora gets the better picture, perhaps, but uh, Marie Therese gets the more complete and evenly uh, realized picture. And when we look here? When you look there, you see what I meant by Dora being the carrier of uh, what is happening in the world around both of them. World War II had begun. The Germans were surrounding their hotel. They were in the streets of Royon. And Picasso was in the hotel with uh, Dora, but the town was infected with Germans. It's now as if the room has closed down on her like a prison. And the huge foot suggests that we, the spectator, the painter, are really on top of her virtually, that we're all enclosed in this terribly contracted, compacted space in which she, as a figure now, is twisted and contorted in a very violent manner. Her hands have become more like horses' hooves. Her mind is uh, divided. Uh, she's looking two ways at the same time. Uh, it's as if somehow uh, Picasso has sought a somatic or bodily image for the sense of being torn in different directions and for the sense of being compressed and surrounded 
by alien things. Now, that's not a picture of the way he feels about Dora, but the way he projects his feelings through Dora. In other words, you can't look at that and say, oh, he thought Dora was an ugly girl. She was not an ugly girl. It's simply that Dora's personality and her image from the beginning had the capacity to become the expressive vehicle for Picasso's anxieties and fears in these years. Time and place, it's 1940, Picasso's living in Paris. Well, he's, he's gone back to Paris from Royan where this yeah. picture was painted. He's living in Paris under the occupation. And he stays there he for stays the duration, there for of, the the duration war. of the war. All right, in the next room, as we go, we will be introduced to another woman who's coming on the scene. She uh, comes on the scene uh, during wartime, though she really, uh, her most important uh, period is a little after that. And uh, I think that her portraits are not quite as uh, extraordinary as those of some of the other women, in part because perhaps of the nature of her beauty. He saw her as such a kind of creature of perfection that a, a certain kind of geometricity entered the pictures. And you see her uh, generally looking either very geometrically or through the metaphor, for example, of the femme fleur, the woman flower. She was an artist. She was an artist, as was uh, Dora Maar, though she was more of a painter. And I think that uh, Francoise understood painting extremely well and was able to have a kind of dialogue with Picasso about art that none of the earlier paramours ever had with him. And what do these portraits of Francoise say about Picasso and the relationship? You have to understand now he's an older man with a very, very young, beautiful girl whose beauty in some way is hard for him to capture. Uh, it's so regular that there's a tendency to make it more geometrical in the pictures than would have been his norm. Uh, there's also a tendency to go very decorative in the pictures. That's partly a sense of Matisse looking over his shoulder, as it were. And if you look at a picture like this one with those flat decorative colors and so forth, of course, Matisse's line would never be quite that geometrical. Uh, but this is a kind of picture which indicates already a certain influence of Matisse that is going to play a role in the rest of Picasso's life. Was it competitive? Was he the painter that Picasso most... They were. He, they, it was competitive since 1907. Uh, they, uh, they saw each other, though, with tremendous respect as being so different from one another. Uh, Matisse said, North Pole, South Pole, you know. Uh, they were and realized that they were the two greatest painters of the century. And they played at rivalry, but they were never really rivals. And the only artist of whom uh, Picasso spoke with great respect and admiration throughout the whole of his life, only living one, was Matisse. And this painting? Well, now this painting comes at the very end, and it has a certain depth and intensity that comes from in a sense, the tragedy that this love, which has produced two children, uh, is breaking up. And it also has the added pathos of the fact that one of the great problems for Francoise was that she was a serious artist, and to be married to Pablo Picasso uh, is somewhat problematic in Could that respect. Such a giant and here, here we see her drawing, you know, and there's a kind of interiority in this image of. Uh, Francoise, which I think was very influenced by uh, uh, Picasso's love of Manet, the earlier style of Manet, of Olympia, uh, for example, gets a big dark area and a big light area, contrasts them, and that gives the picture boldness. And then within those two areas, Manet would nuance it very, very closely, and that gives it its delicacy and sophistication. I think there's something of Manet in this picture. And there is also a kind of profundity in the image of the yeah. woman, though things are now about at their end, that we don't get earlier. In each of these women, 
is it impossible to say which is your favorite portrait? Because in each of the portraits, it depends on where it was on the arc of the relationship. Picasso has to work up to a great picture. It may take 10, 15 bad pictures to get a good one. Uh, I've often said, and it shocks people, that Picasso made more bad paintings than any other painter in history, uh, <laughs> but he also made more masterpieces than any other painter in history. I think these are amongst the most beautiful of the portraits of Francoise, but I think that he never quite got a fix on Francoise for himself. Much is made of this relationship. She wrote a book about it. This was something that disturbed Picasso enormously because it's really a first in history that a great artist is written about intimately by a woman that he has had a relationship with. He once said to me about this book, it's just not done. You know, you don't, such books don't get written during the lifetime of an artist. You know, uh, well, it was done. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a book which uh, is not without a lot of interesting insights, but it also is written from a very clear perspective of a woman who has had an unhappy relationship and feels embittered. There is also this notion that she said at the end of the relationship, or when she wrote a book, I spent 10 years with him. I knew him, but he didn't know me. Well, you know, I don't quite know what such things mean. I think that he knew her in a way that comes out in the pictures uh, better than uh, she might have thought. But, you know, in a certain sense, the pictures are the way he knows people. Uh, the way he behaved with her, what he did and so forth and so on, uh, it may very well be that Francoise felt that he didn't understand her psychology. He understood her as he could understand her, and that was not the Francoise that Francoise bore in her own mind as her image. But I think it's also possible that Francoise and some other people at Picasso, other women at Picasso knew, had never quite understood that no woman was ever going to be number one in his life. Art was going to be number yes. one in his life. Art was number one. He once said, and it sounds cruel, but it's perfectly honest, that he would sacrifice wife and children for his art. We conclude with Rubens' summing up of Picasso, his genius, his legacy, and his contribution to art. In the end, what do you say about him in the context of the history of art? In older periods, you had one, maybe two styles that dominated painting. The difference between Raphael and his teacher Perugino is measured in very narrow ways. But you go into a museum of modern art and you see a Chagall, a Dufy, a Mondrian, a Picasso, and you recognize them immediately by their style. The style is the man. And most 20th century artists have signature styles, which means that you're going to have, in a museum of modern art, a great many different styles. Well, Picasso encompasses this in a single man. Uh, and he has either created or practiced, with the exception of completely abstract painting, non-figurative painting, he has practiced or created every one of those styles. And I think that's perhaps his unique position. Beyond that is his enigma. Uh, you keep finding out things about Picasso. I've been with it for years, and every time I turn around, I find a drawing that reveals some new dimension. Uh, I'm easily bored, uh, and there are painters who I still think are wonderful painters, but I have no desire to work on them anymore. I have never had a moment when I haven't had a question about Picasso. And this exhibit, finally, yeah. answers well, well I, I'm not going to say it answers. I hope it throws light on a change in the nature of portraiture that was wrought by modern artists in general, beginning with Van Gogh and Cezanne, but more markedly by Picasso than anyone else, and in more different ways by Picasso than anyone else, and that, in effect, the way great artists do, it changes the definition of what we come to understand as a portrait. Uh, the portrait didn't exist as most people understand it before the Renaissance. It was the invention of artists, because the word portrait uh, simply meant an image of. 
and was used for centuries that way before it had to do anything uh, with the kind of thing that you think of yeah. as a portrait. Now, Picasso has undermined a lot of that and opened it up at the same time to include a great many other possibilities, mostly of a subjective nature. The artist was always present in great portraiture, but more marginally than Picasso. Now, Picasso, in effect, says the camera has taken over the role of memorializing the way people look, yeah. which was the main reason that portraits got painted for centuries, not uh, for reasons of great art, right. but for memorializing. So since the camera can do that, we, the artist, should do what the camera can't do. And that has to do with what has been the artist part, the art part, what Goya and Velasquez brought to their great portraits that others did not uh, is what counts in those portraits. And uh, you know, if you look at all the portraits of Napoleon, uh, they were all very different. Napoleon didn't change very much. It's the artists that changed. And I think that what Picasso was saying, in effect, is portraiture has always been, and I'm going to make it now quite clear that it is, about the artist's response to the subject and not primarily the subject, if we can even say that anyone exists outside of our own senses and outside of our own meaning. Thank you. So, Ruben, it's a pleasure to see this. It's a pleasure right. to uh, get to know Picasso through your eyes. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us this evening for this look at Pablo Picasso. It is just part of some of the things you will see in November when I present three programs on three artists. November 3rd, Vermeer. November 10th, Picasso. And November 17th, Cezanne.